the things that you couldn't do or you could not get in, 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 in July, God will restore it in August. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. I hear a voice, a word. It says somebody will dance again. Amen. I, I don't know about you, but God says somebody will dance again. Amen. Hallelujah. If, if you are the one, let me hear your loudest. Amen. Amen. And tell somebody, I will dance again. Tell somebody else, I will dance again. It doesn't matter what I went through in July. But my God is still good. And I will dance again. Hallelujah. You will dance again. This morning we are doing part two of what we started last week. We took the, uh, the, the theme of our, um, our series was behind the scene. And we took the word from Judges chapter 13, 1 to 23. Judges chapter 13. Hallelujah. And so we read the word. You know, sometimes in the house you don't read. The only time you read is when you come to church. So it's a good opportunity for us to read. Amen. Do you have your Bibles with you? Okay, if you have your Bibles with you, let's open up. Bibles to the book of Judges chapter 13. It's a long verse, but we'll read it. It says, And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hands of the Philistines forty years. And there was a certain man of Zorah, of the family of the Danites, whose name was Manoah, and his wife was barren and bare not. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto the woman and said unto her, Behold now, thou art barren and bear not, but thou shalt conceive and bear a son. Now therefore beware, I pray thee, and, I'll, and drink not wine nor strong drink, and eat not any unclean thing. For lo, thou shalt conceive and bear a son, and no razor shall come on his head. For the child shall be a Nazarite unto God from the womb, and he shall begat, and he shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hands of the Philistines. When the woman came and told her husband, saying, A man of God came unto me, and his countenance was like the countenance of, of, of an angel of God, very terrible. But I asked him, not hence he was, neither told he me his name. But he said unto me, Behold, thou shalt conceive and bear a son, and now drink no wine nor strong drink, neither eat any unclean thing, for the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb to the day of his death. Then Manoah entreated the Lord and said, O oh my Lord, let the man of God which thou didst send again unto us, teach us what we shall do unto the child that shall be born. And, and God hearkened to the voice of Manorah, and the angel of God came again un, unto the woman as she sat in the field. But no, Manorah, her husband, was not with her. And the woman made haste and ran and showed her husband and said unto him, Behold, man, has appeared unto me, that came unto me the other day. And Manoah arose and went after his wife, and came to the man, and said unto him, Are thou the man that speaks unto the woman? And he said, I am. And Manoah said, Now let thy words come to pass. How shall we order the child? And how shall we, and how shall we do unto him? And the angel of the Lord said unto Manoah, Of all that I have said unto the woman, let her beware. She may not eat anything that comes out of the vine. Hmm. Neither let her drink wine or strong drink, nor eat any unclean thing. All that I commanded her, let her observe. And Manoah said unto the angel of the Lord, I pray thee, let us detain thee until we shall have made ready a kid for thee. And the angel of the Lord said unto Manoah, Though thou detain me, I will not eat any bread. If thou wilt offer me a burnt, 
if thou will offer a burnt offering, thou must offer it unto the Lord. For, Na, for Manoah knew not that he was an angel of the Lord. And Manoah and said unto the angel of the Lord, What is thy name? What, what when, that when the same comes to pass, we may do this honor. And the angel of the Lord said unto him, Why ask, ask said thou my name? See, it is a secret. So Manoah took a kid with a meat offering and offered it upon a rock unto the Lord. And the angel did wondrously. And Manoah and his wife looked on. For it came to pass, when the flame went up towards heaven from off the altar, that the angel of the Lord ascended in the flame of the altar. And Manoah and his wives looked on it and fell on their face to the ground. But the angel of the Lord did not appear unto Manoah and his wife. When Manoah knew that he was an angel, then Manoah knew that he was an angel of the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. Amazing word. Amen. Uh, last week we looked at behind the sin and we said sin does what? We see sin exposes us to what? Our enemies. Be it a nation, a tribe, or a people, or a family. Hallelujah. And then number two, we said human weaknesses is sometimes an opportunity for God's divine what? Selection. And then we did number three. Did we do number three? Number three, we said, your calling determines your lifestyle. Hallelujah. Your calling determines what? Your lifestyle. And we learned that um, uh, God was calling Samson as a deliverer. And God said that Samson cannot drink wine. But you know that the angel said that the mother too cannot drink wine. Did you observe that? So, what you carry determines what you do. So not only is the baby not allowed to drink wine, but the mother that carries the baby is also not allowed to drink wine. When the Lord calls you, based on what the Lord has called you to do and the, and, and, and the, and the responsibility that that anointing will carry. Hallelujah. So for every anointing, there is what? A responsibility. Tell somebody, for every anointing, there is a responsibility. For every anointing, there is a responsibility. God was giving the woman a special son. And he said, the son will not drink. He cannot touch on clean things. But you, the woman also, you cannot drink, you cannot touch on clean things. So we learn that we must not compare ourselves to others, but our lifestyle must be based on the anointing we want to carry. Hallelujah. Our lifestyle must be based on the anointing we want to do what? We want to carry. When John the Baptist was going to be born, God told, sent an angel to tell Elizabeth specific things that she must do. Hallelujah. The same way we see here something also, God is asking that there are specific things that she, she and the baby cannot do. Hallelujah. Now we go to the third point. When the baby was born, the angel said, this baby, verse 5 or so, let's see, let's see verse 5. It said, lo, for lo, thou shalt conceive and bear a son, and no razor shall come on his head, for the child shall be a Nazarite unto God from the womb, and he shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. And I want to believe that all of you know who a Nazarite is. But if you don't know, for, 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 uh, for, a doubt. A Nazarite is somebody in the Jewish culture, there are people who decide that they will live all their life for God. Okay? And it started in, in the book of Leviticus. Okay? Where God said 
there are people who can decide that they have this, they, they're going to live all their life for Christ. Or there are people who will also be born, but they are not born to do their will. But they are born to do the will of what? The will of God. Hallelujah. So, such a person, the person will not, he cannot watch a dead body. So, a Nazarite, if, he, if his parents die, he is not supposed to go to the funeral. He is not supposed to touch the dead body. He is not supposed to watch a dead body. He is not supposed to uh, shave his beard. The only time a Nazarite can shave his beard and his hair is the day he decides not to be a Nazarite. He, they will take him to the temple, and in the temple, he will shave his beard, and he will bring an, a, 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 a sacrifice, a sacrifice of a lamp. And they will use his beard and his hair as the uh, charcoal to burn the sacrifice. From that day, that oath of a Nazarite is broken. But until then, his hair must not be touched. All his life, his hair must not be touched. So the reason is that wherever he appears, everybody will know that this person has decided to be unique and he has decided to serve God all his life. Hallelujah. Some of the Nazarites in the Bible were Samuel. Samuel was also a Nazarite. Samuel, never, Samuel was a Rastafarian. I know the Rastafarians who like it. They say, yeah, <laughs> hallelujah. Samuel was a Nazarite. You know, you know, when they gave birth to Samuel, you remember that he, uh, Samuel's mother went to the temple and said that if God give me a child by this time, I will give her what? I will give him back to God and that he will be dedicated to God and no razor shall touch what? His head. Hallelujah. So Samuel was also a Nazarite. Samuel was a Nazarite throughout all his life. That's why he was one of the most prof uh, powerful prophets. Okay? John the Baptist was also a Nazarite. You know? and, and, and the greatest of all the Nazarites was Jesus Christ himself. Amen. Hallelujah. He was the greatest of all the Nazarites. You know? uh, the Rastafarians would say, yeah, yeah, yeah. Hallelujah. Amen. So this is a basic um, background of the Nazarite. Okay, it's a dedicated life. But number four, what we learned today is this. He says he shall deliver his people. So it brings us to the fourth point. which says that we are born for a reason. We are born for what? We are born for a reason and for a season. We are born for a reason and a season. For a season. Every single one of us here on earth you are not here by mistake. You are here because God wants you to be here. You were born by the parents you were born of because God wants you to be born there. There is a reason for which we are born. The only reason why most of the time we get frustrated is when we begin to live out of our reason of being birthed. When we begin to do things that are not in line with the reason why we were born. That is why we begin to suffer. But if we are going to live a happy life, if we are going to live a dedicated life, if we are going to live a fulfilled life, you must know the reason for which you are born. Jesus, the Bible says to Jeremiah, he says, I knew you. God knew you before you were formed in your mother's womb. He said, before you were formed in your mother's, uh, your mother's womb, I knew you. And I chose you. I called you. I set you apart to use you for my glory. Hallelujah. Somebody here, perhaps you were, your mother and father were just doing some playing around. And you were born. But in God's plan, it was not a playing around. It's for a purpose. Hallelujah. My prayer for you is that you will discover why you are on this earth. You will discover the reason why you were born. I believe every single person under the sound of my voice here, whether the children or the adults, every one of you, there is a great reason why God created you. There is a great reason why God created you. There is a reason why God brought you on this earth. And it is up to you to discover that reason and pray about it. And with no shadow of doubt, I can tell you that if you pray and ask God, why am I here? and you are sincere about it, God will show you why you are here. I will tell you a reason. I, 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 your pastor, 
I find now that the reason why God brought me on this earth, I find it out. I find out that God brought me to train young people for the next generation. I am a bridge. I am what? I am a bridge. God brought me to train young people. The day I find out that, I have, it is the day that I decided to live in my lane. Do you know what happened? I will show you how I find out my vision and my purpose, what God has called me to do. One day there was some issues, and it has to do with national issues. And, 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 and a, a very senior person who was doing something wrong, and, and the Lord showed me visions concerning some things that will happen. And I sent the message to the person, and I told the person, the Lord said, if you don't stop this thing you are, going, you are doing, this and this person will die in your life. And truly, truly, the message I gave the person happened. Somebody very important in his life died. And after all those things, I was frustrated. And I said, Lord, why? why, why? You are telling me what to do and I'm telling the person and the person is not listening. And then, one day, listen carefully, so that when you come to trailblazers and you see children, you see young people, you will be confused. After the event, I was praying. And I had a vision. I had a vision. In the vision, I saw myself in a huge warehouse. Very big warehouse. And in the warehouse, there were a lot of puppies. You know, dogs. Plenty. Thousands and thousands of puppies. You can't see their end. A lot of them. And they were moving around. And they were just walking around and doing what they like. And then when they opened the warehouse, they brought me into the warehouse. And they said, this is your ministry. This is your calling now. Dress them and raise an army out of them for me. I heard the voice. And in the vision, I saw that I have trained the puppies, the dogs. I wore them uniform, like military uniform. I sat them down like a line and I taught them how to march and they became very disciplined, powerful army. And they, I was the one leading them and we were marching left, right, and they were following me left, right, and attention, then they all stopped. And we became a mighty nation. And God said, I have called you to raise the next generation. That's my work. From that day, I'm, I am no longer confused. That's why, you know, last week I was talking to a pastor. I was with um, uh, Bra Evans. And the pastor said, as for, as for him, he said, I ministry, no. And I smiled. I said, Hey, who will trace blazes? Who is Israel? Because I saw it, I didn't call him. And you are sorry and you are not because you are afraid of you. I won't mean you that. So, be see, I'm sorry, die. Ah, oh dear. I'm going to go to the minister too. But see, I'm going to go to the offering. I'm going to go to the offering. Uncle Levans, am I lying? But see, I'm going to go to the offering. That why should you waste the anointing there? So, I find out that that is what God has called me to do to raise young people. Raising young people is stubborn. It is difficult. You know you are stubborn. But you are changing in Jesus' name. <laughs> you know, God has called me to raise young people, youth, leaders. That is why when I stand here, I prophesy. And I say, presidents are coming out of our church. That is why I stand here and I prophesy. And I say, the next speaker of parliament is coming from our church. The next, spe- uh, the next uh, uh, what? Anybody you can think in Ghana, there will be some in trailblazers. Any good person, not everybody. Hallelujah. So the same way you two, as you are sitting here, there is a reason why God brought you on this earth. God didn't just bring you on this earth to come and eat, go to work, come and sleep and die. Go to work, uh, uh, wake up, brush your teeth, bath, go to work, come back home, eat, sleep, go to work, brush your teeth. Ah, No, God would have created a robot. Hallelujah. 
But because God has a purpose for you, He has a reason for you. That is why He brought you on this earth. So look for that reason and begin to live in it. You will be fulfilled. Hallelujah. You will be fulfilled. Samson, you are the savior of the, of the people of God. And one thing about God is that even though he has called us to minister to young people, as we serve the young people well, this church will have more old people than what other churches are looking for. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. As you serve God, and you look for your reason of being, you will be a happy person. Don't look at what others are doing. Men said you will be here. Look at what God has called you to do. As for Samson, you are a savior. And for saviors, they must not touch wine. They must not drink strong wine. They must not touch alcohol. So every single one of us, there is a reason why God brought you here. And when you discover that reason, you will be shocked. I read a book about a woman called Helen Keller. How many of you know her? Helen Keller was born blind, deaf, and dumb. Can you believe that? She was born what? Blind, deaf, and what? To be deaf and dumb is trouble. To be blind is also what? But to be, de- to be born deaf, dumb, blind... It's double trouble. But do you know something? This woman wrote 5,000 songs. She wrote how many songs? When she discovered her gifts. A deaf person, a dumb person, who cannot hear, yet writes music. She wrote 5,000 songs. And guess what? Do you know one of her songs? Blessed assurance, Jesus, oh, what a of glory divine, heirs of salvation, purchase of God, born of his spirit, washing his blood. This is my story. This is my song. The blind woman wrote it. It's okay, even. <laughs> you, the blind woman wrote it. If you discover the reason why God created you, you will find out that there is greatness in you. You may be born in Joma, but there is something in you greater than Joma. You'll be born in Malam, but there is something in you greater than Malam. You'll be born in Agozome, but there is something in you greater than Agozome. You may be born a Ghanaian, but there is something in you greater than Ghana. There is a gift of God in you. And it is up to you to discover that gift. When you discover that gift, the world will hear of you. I say the world will hear of you. There are songs in you that the world must hear. There are books in you the world must hear. There are stories in you that the world must hear. I believe that there will come a time in this church that we will have people who will write films. People who will write films. There will be filmmakers in this house. There will be promoters in this house. Some of the greatest footballers will be in our church. Some of the greatest sportsmen will be in our church. Some of the best writers will be in our church. Yes, there is greatness in you. The problem is you have not discovered it yet. You have not discovered it yet. But spend time in the presence of the creator. The one who created you. He knows what he placed in you. And if you are willing to go back to him and ask him, Lord, what did you put in me? I believe that he is willing to tell you what he placed in you. If you look at the story carefully, you will find out that when Manoah's wife came to tell him that an angel said we are going to conceive and this and this and that, Manoah went back and prayed and said, Lord, give us further and better particulars. Show us this gift you want to give us. You know, this child you want to give us. How should we handle her? How should we handle him? You know, most of the time, 
The problem we have is that when God gives us a miracle, we don't ask him why did he give us a miracle. We normally don't find out why did God put that money in your hand. Why did God give you that child? Why did God give you that car? You know, one day, one day, I, 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 the Lord blessed us financially. And I had some money I was not expecting. I had some money I was not expecting. And, 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 and I look at the thing and I say, no, this money, the way I, the Lord blessed me with this money, I don't think it is money for food. So that day I prayed and I said, Lord, I was not expecting so much, but you have blessed me with this money. Why did you just bless us so much within a very short time with this? And I had, it, I had a vision that I was using it to finish a church building. Do you, do you understand? In the vision, I, I, I saw that I, I was painting and, and repairing a certain church building. Then when I woke up in the morning, I told mama, I said, the money I received is not for food, it's for finishing a certain church building. Yeah, or, or, organize the people. Let's go and work on that project. As a Christian, whatever God puts in your hand, there is a reason for it. When God gave Samson, Samson was not for Manora and the wife to go and do show and tell people that Mesu Mebana Yaede, Mesu Akwalan Mayede, Mesu Mawubi. Something was not for show. Something was for deliverance. Do you know that? Do you know that it means that something they cannot do adoring for something like the way they do for every child? Because you be adoring and then I can no. And yet they say for something you can't do that for him. It means that adoring crowd one say you on your On your be. Yeah. So when God calls you, there is a reason why God calls you. There is a reason why you were born. Look for that reason. Pray about it. Vampire for home. Ask yourself, Lord, why did you put me in trailblazers? Lord, why did you bring me to this church? Lord, why am I here? Ask God for it. God will tell you the reason why. If you don't find the reason, you will be frustrated. A lot of us, the day we discovered our purpose, the day we discover our reason, that is the day you will be a happy person in your life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And then the next thing we will see in the, that scripture, number, number five. In order to fulfill your destiny, you must avoid the anointing killers. In order to fulfill your destiny, you must avoid what? Anointing killers. There are people we call what? The anointing killers. There are things we call anointing killers. They kill anointing. They are like mosquito quail. If you are a mosquito and they bring it close to you, you will die. Hallelujah. And the same way, if God give calls you, there are things in your life that if you allow them close to you to kill the anointing, it's only a matter of time. I was talking to Brad Philip and he made a statement. He said, Samson slept a Rasta man. He woke up a Sakura. There are people, if you walk with, you will sleep a Rasta man and wake up what? A Sakura. Hallelujah. You wake up what? Can you imagine something with all the dreadlocks? Oh, sorry, I'm not sure you're a mirror anymore. Ah, he checked. Where is the hair? He shakes, nothing shakes. He's not a bald hair. Do you know why? Because he was working with anointing killers. The anointing killers are the delilahs. And you must avoid them. Hallelujah. And this morning, I will share with you. I have been able to identify 10 anointing killers and 14 anointing boosters. Hallelujah. I have I've done anointing killers and anointing what? Boosters. There are things that boost your anointing and there are things that also what? Kills your anointing. So, let me share some of the things that kill anointing with you. 
Number one, bad friends. Number one, bad friends. Listen, not everybody must be your friend. Not everybody. Not everybody. If, if, if you want to carry the anointing, you must learn separation. If you want to carry the anointing, you must learn how to separate yourself. The day the Holy Spirit came upon Jesus, where did he lead him to? He led him to the wilderness. True or false? Did he lead him to the marketplace? He led him to the wilderness. Separation. So the first step of anointing is separation. If you cannot separate yourself from some people, you can never be anointed. There are people who you must always make it a point to separate yourself from them. Else you can't carry the anointing. If you don't allow them to live your life, some things can never happen in your life. Until Lot left the life of Abraham, God never told him that, lift up your head and see, I give you the land. There are lots that needs to live in order for you to see your future. There are people in your life, look, as long as they are not going your direction, as long as they are not ready to do what you want to do and to go where you want to go, you must give way for them to live your life. There are people who are like scaffold. Do you know scaffold? You see, when you are putting up a building, when, putting up, when we were building this uh, auditorium, we had a lot of scaffold, even inside here because of the ceiling. And when we finished the building, what did we do? We removed all the scaffold out. The same way in your life. There are people who are scaffold. At a certain time of your life, they will be there. But at another time of your life, they must leave. We cannot finish the building and have this scaffold in. Is it possible? We must remove them. The same way at a certain time of your life, there are people who must give room. If you don't let them go, the building will never be completed. They have finished their work. There are people who are like bulldozers. You know when they are doing a road, they bring the bulldozer with a round tie. That is what compresses the ground and everything. But when they finish the road, it cannot work on it. If it work on it, it will break the road. There are people like that in your life. At a certain time, God will bring them to level the ground. But after they finish, you must look for a payloader and put them on and send them away. If you allow them to walk in your life, they will break the same road they have done. They will break everything. So if you want to carry the anointing, there are people you cannot work with. You cannot work with them. You have to separate yourself. Jesus separated himself. Do you know the reason why we are suffering in this world is because of one man who befriended a wrong person Adam and Eve went and befriend a snake. If you befriend a snake, you will be thrown out of your divine garden. Adam and Eve befriend a snake. When they were supposed to be talking to the Holy Spirit, they were talking to evil spirits. And what did the snake do? The snake caused them to lose their garden. And how do we restore, how do we receive our, our lost garden? We receive our garden back by relationship with Jesus Christ. We lost our garden through relationship with the devil, but the garden is restored through relationship with who? Jesus Christ. So when we befriend Jesus Christ, our garden is restored to us. So number one, number one anointing killer is bad relationship. If you walk with people who smoke, you will soon learn to smoke. Even if you don't hold the cigarette or you don't hold the weed, as long as you sit down and they smoke and puff it out, whose nose is it going to? So you are, you, are, you, are, you, are, you are the same as them. The difference is that one is holding the weed and you are smoking it. Hallelujah. One is smoking the weed on your behalf. You are sitting here. The person is sitting here. He is smoking. You are not holding the weed. But you are also smoking. 
Because both of you are breathing the same. Hallelujah. So that is number one anointing killer. Bad relationship. You remember um, uh, 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 Judas. You see Judas befriend the enemies of Jesus Christ. And that led to his death. Hallelujah. Judas befriend the enemy of Jesus Christ. And that led to what? His death. Number two, number two anointing killer is idolatry and fornication. Idolatry and fornication. It is the quickest way to kill anointing. Drama and ball. It's the easiest and the quickest way to kill an anointing. Look, this one, it is so powerful that even the fetish priest knows it. Even the fetish priest knows it. So there are people who go to even the fetish priest and they will say, Adredia, what do you want to buy at this time? I be true of us. Yes. Idolatry is the fastest killer of anointing. I've always said, if you want to kill a man, any man who womanizes and any man who drinks, it's easy to kill him. Because you can use these two things to kill the person easily. But a man who doesn't drink, who doesn't womanize, is difficult to kill him. Because they be an need a hope. Do you understand? But be on umsa, or be on pemban and any naho. Ope bibia, one head of state, I learned when they wanted to kill him. They wanted to kill the head of state. They did everything, it was not possible. So they found out that he really, really liked women. So they went and bribed the women, her, her concubines. And they injected poison into her apple. And the woman came to her and said, Oh, today I bought you some special apple. When he took the apple, he had cardiac arrest and died. One head of state. For diplomatic reason, I can't mention her name. His name. Yeah, I'm telling you. But when he was alive, nobody could kill him. But a woman killed him with apple. I think he didn't go to Sunday school. If he went to Sunday school, he would have read it. That it was an apple that killed Adam and Eve. Hallelujah. Very interesting. Fornication. It's a fastest killer of anointing. Can't you see when you go and fornicate and you are coming out, it's like something has left you. Hallelujah. Everybody is quiet because you don't want it to look like you are the one. But also, who pop Jamai now about Friday Muhanoba? And then we tell you to do, do. I say we are saying you're not yourself. No, we need you. Hallelujah. I say we tell you to do, do. I say yeah, sure we. Hallelujah. If you want God to increase your anointing. Guard your emotion from fornication. Very important. Very, very important. Number three. Worldly music. I'm teaching you the anointing killer. So, Worldly music. Every music is not the same. Worldly music. Don't play with music. Music is the fastest way to deliver somebody and also make somebody oppressed. Let me, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me show you that. You see, we say music is the door to the soul. Music is the door to what? The soul. So if you want to enter the soul of somebody, use the music he likes. Do you understand? And evil spirits attaches themselves also to music. And the same way, the Holy Spirit also attaches itself to music. The Bible says that when Saul was demon possessed, what did they do for the, music, the evil spirit to go? Were they praying? What were they doing? David came and played the harp. And as David played the harp, the Bible says the evil spirit fled from Saul. The evil spirit left. So, the music you expose yourself to is extremely important. 
You cannot be listening to profane music. You will be demon possessed without knowing that you have been demon possessed. You cannot be watching pornography. There are things you must not watch. If you watch them, you will be possessed with the spirit of lust. You will not know the day you were possessed. Later on in life, you will see that you are doing things that you are surprised at yourself. You will become, you, 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 you will do things that you are like, ah, when did I start lasting after a woman like that? It was the last time you were watching the film. Because you know something, there are five gates. Listen carefully. There are five gates to your soul. Five gates. Number one, your eyes. Your eye is a gate. Anything you see, it goes into the soul. You can use the eye. That's why during deliverance session, I can stand and be watching somebody and the person will fall down. It's a gate. Number two, your nose. Your nose is a gate. What you even smell is a problem. Let me show you the reason why. Can't you see that there are perfumes that even the people involved in the other side of the, the, the pen, uh, uh, pendulum or whatever, there are demonic perfumes that if they are going to do their occultic rites, they pour the perfume down. They do their incantations. Demons will appear immediately. Hallelujah. So your nose is even a gate. Your nose is even a gate. The third gate is your mouth. Your mouth is a gate. What you eat, what goes into your mouth, is a gate. And then the fourth gate is your private part, your sex organ. They are gates. That is why the Bible says the two shall become what? One. It's a gate. And your skin is also a gate. This skin you see. That is why when Jesus got resurrected from the dead, Jesus said to Mary Magdalene, don't do what? Don't touch me for I have not seen the Father. Because when you touch me, something will do what? What happened? So if you don't allow everybody to be touching you, if you're a lady, you don't allow people to be touching you by heart. There are transfers. That's why when you lay hands on somebody, there is a transfer of spirit. So it's not everybody you even allow them to lay their hands on you. Except somebody who you know is credible and is a proper man of God. Don't meet any stranger and say, Then you allow him to put his hand on you. What do you mean? Don't allow it. If you don't know him, never allow him to lay his hand on you. Even if he's a pope. If you don't know him. Because in laying hands there is transfer of spirit. Hallelujah. So these five gates are very important. Get put them in your heart. Hallelujah. Number what? Number four. One of the gates that open uh, 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 anointing killers is disobedient. Disobedient. Disobedient to parents. Disobedient to your pastor. Disobedient to the man of God. Disobedient to those God has set ahead of you. Disobedient to people who God has put ahead of you. Look, it is one of the ways you kill your anointing. Hallelujah. The Bible says that God made Saul a king. And when God made Saul a king, God told Saul that, look, when you go, kill all the animals. Kill everything. And God said it through the prophet Samuel. And so the prophet Samuel came and told Saul, kill all the animals. Kill everything. Saul goes there, sees the fat animals, and says that he is coming to offer them as, as sacrifice. When he came back, the Bible says that the, the, the Lord came to, 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 Samuel, uh, to Saul through Samuel and said that disobedient is as witchcraft. That because of your disobedience, today the anointing to be a king has been taken away from you. So disobedient takes the anointing from you. And one disobedient that really kills anointing is disobedient to parents. Learn to obey your father and mother is one of the biggest anointing releases. 
as long as what your mother and your father is saying is not contrary to the word of God, but it's in tune with the word of God, obey them. Even if you don't understand, but it's in the will of God. If it is not in the will of God and it's against the word of God, that one, I don't agree you obey them. But even that, you must learn how to do it politely. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So one of the anointing killers is disobedience. When you disobey your mother and you disobey their, your father and they continuously speak negative into your life, it will affect you. It will affect you. So one of the things you must learn is learn to provoke the blessing of your fathers. Learn to provoke the blessing of your pastors. Learn to provoke your, the blessing of the man of God who has been set over your head. You must provoke blessings. Once a while, do something for your mother to bless you. One of the problems in Africa is that we curse more than we bless. It's easy for a mother to curse the child, but difficult for him to bless the child. How many times have your mother or father called you and laid his hand on you and said, May the Lord bless you and may you be great. Very few Africans does that. But it is easy for the mother to say, Uber bread. Hallelujah. And so, extremely important, if you don't want to kill your anointing, learn to be obedient to simple instructions. Another, another killer of anointing is lying. It's lying. Anytime you are lying, you are killing your anointing. Do you know why? Because God will have to take away the power from your mouth, else you will destroy yourself. Do you understand? Yeah. Anytime you are lying, you kill the anointing. Let me give you a typical example in the scriptures again. When Gehazi was walking with Elisha, and Elisha said the, 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 the soldier, Naaman, should not give the offering. And, 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 and Gehazi went and collected the thing and came and lied. Since that day, the anointing that he was supposed to carry, they took away the anointing from him. Hallelujah. When he came, he came to light. The master asked him, where did you go? Instead of acknowledging that I went to go, I did this and I did that. He said, I didn't go anywhere. And Elisha said, was I not with you in the chariots? So every time you are lying, you are weakening your anointing. Because the Holy Spirit cannot walk with a liar. The Holy Spirit cannot walk with a liar. So that is the next thing that kills anointing that you need to look at. And then, number what? Number six. Alcohol and smoking kills anointing. Alcohol and smoking. The Bible says that your body is the temple of what? The, of the living God. If God wanted you to smoke, when God created you, he would have given you an exhaust pipe. Do you understand? God would have given you what? Exhaust pipe. There will be exhaust at your back. When you smoke, then you do vroom, vroom. Then you see it's coming out. <laughs> Hallelujah. Because we know cars smoke. So we gave the cars exhaust. Am I right? So you think God in his own wisdom... Didn't know. God knows that you needed a nose, not an exhaust pipe. Hallelujah. And not only is it not good for your body, but it is also not good for your spirit. Do you know why drinking and smoking is not good? Because it dampens your sense of judgment. So when you are even doing the wrong thing, you don't know. I hope you understand. So there are people who, you know, he, he cannot insult you. But when he drinks, he can come and insult you. So the, it makes you vulnerable. And when you read the Bible, any time you saw people drink, they did the wrong thing. Noah got drunk. By the time he finished, he, he ended cursing all his, he cursed his son. Am I right? The king Herod got drunk and, and told the son to dance. By the time he finished, he has promised the head of who? John the Baptist. 
So it makes us make wrong decisions that are against ourselves and others. Hallelujah. And so they kill anointing. They really, really kill anointing. And you know the most amazing thing? When they are killing the anointing, you will not even know that the anointing is being killed. Hallelujah. You will not know that the anointing is being what? Is being killed. And then the next anointing killer, killer is pride and love for money. Pride. Anyone who is proud, one day God will disappoint you. It's only a matter of time. If you want to work with God, humility must be the air you breathe. If you want to work with God, because the Bible says God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. The more you work with God, the more humble you must become if you want to survive. That's one of the things I've found out. No matter how God promotes you, always remember that you used to be nobody. It's just the grace of God that made you who you are. And the Bible also says, it says, let this mind that was in Christ Jesus be in you. That even though it was not robbery to equate himself with God, yet he humbled himself. So one of the highest form of anointing is humility. And found it's only a matter of time. Now, What did they make here? Jimmy Because it's too much man. When the pen you know, obey you say when you are correct. Obey you say when you are doing. Would you? Would you? Would you be there? Don't worry. God's own time. God will honor you. Hallelujah. So one of the anointing killers is when pride sets in. You are now so proud. And let me show you. Last time I was teaching the shepherds signs and symptoms of a dying Christian and a dying shepherd. If you come to church and we are doing praise and worship. And you cannot raise your hands and dance and praise. You are proud. Can I hear your amen? I say if we are doing praise and worship. And you for you, you are so gentle. You can't lift your hands and say hallelujah. You are proud. Check yourself. I'm telling you. If you are doing praise and worship, you can't open your mouth and sing. You are proud. I'm telling you. It's a simple test. If, 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 if you can't do some of those basic things, it's a sign. That's why, look, nobody is bigger than praise and worship. The only person bigger than praise and worship is God. So the day praise and worship can't move you, then you have become a God. Come and let's worship you. Hallelujah. Pride is the fastest killer of anointing. Do you know that Satan used to be God's son? Are you aware? Hey, Satan was God's son. His name was called Lucifer. Do you understand Lucifer? Son of the morning. The bright morning star. Satan was one of God's favorite son. He was handsome. If you say handsome. So handsome. So nice. Until he became proud. And said, I will not do praise and worship again. I will now take the praise and worship. No, that's why I'm telling you that if you can't lift up your hand and you can't praise God and you can't dance, be careful. You think it's simple, but it's not simple. That was the first step that Satan, Lucifer turned into Satan. That was the first step. Satan was first the choir master in heaven. He's the one who will lead the angels and they will sing. And when they sing and the glory of God is displaying the form of lightning and thunder all over the heavens and Satan is watching it and one day Satan comes and says, Ah, is it only God that should take all this glory? We are the one who do all the singing and then he takes all the glory. Charlie, hey, you two sing for me and let me see. And then Satan sits down and they start singing and then he also says, Hey, I didn't hear though. The next time, it's time for praise and worship. 
Satan says his leg is failing him. He cannot stand. The next time he says, Popoyeno. Hey! Now he cannot praise and shout again. Oh. Hey! Never outgrow praise and worship. Let me tell you, one thing that excites God is people who he has promoted. But ultimately, who yet for my rather. And in trailblazers, that is the spirit I want you to have. During praise and worship, and found your way. Who the tum tum no? You are kumbesa. Ah. Hey. She said that you are the fool. You say that yeah. She said no more sir. Obesa. She 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 she. Sir, program no. Oh my oh my yo TV no. Michelle na mi buefu. Your friend is saying. The asa. Asa meba. But a real sin bought Chinima na obesa. Yeah. You must praise God with your body. It's, a, it's an anointing. Do you know why I said it's, it's, it, it? And when you dance and praise God, you increase your anointing. I can prove it in the Bible. Do you, let, let me show you. You remember, David, one day they were bringing the Ark of the Covenant. And David was so excited. And the Bible said, David danced till all his dress what? Came off. And he was naked. Then the wife saw David dancing like that. And the wife said, Ah, king, who do you think you are? How are you dancing like a fool? Why are you dancing like one of these slaves? And then David turned and, and, and looked at the wife and said, Look, I will dance like a fool today. I will dance like a fool tomorrow. I used to be a shepherd boy in the bush. Nobody knew me. God took me from the bush. And God made me a king. And your father was the king. God took away the kingdom. You, you people who know better, your father was the king. God took away the kingdom from him and gave it to a bush boy like me. I will dance today. I will dance tomorrow. Do you know why they were arguing? God was angry. Arguing. God was angry. God turned to and asked the angel, close her womb. The Bible says from that day, the womb of was shut up. When you come to praise and worship, and they are praising, and they are worshiping, and you are commenting, your wombs are being closed. I'm telling you, it also means that praise and worship can open the womb. Because the opposite of what closes can open. So if the wombs were closed by praise and lack of praise and worship, then the womb can be opened by praise and worship. Do you know why? I will share a revelation with you. The Bible says, out of the mouth of what? Babies. He has ordained what? So if the perfect praise must come, then the wombs must be opened for babies to be born so God can get the perfect praise. And from this Sunday, Sorry, that is why I like praise. That's why you see me standing in the, among the instrumentalists. I am doing this, I'm connecting this. I say, hey, this, hey, how I wish I can play drum like everyone play drum. It's one of the things that pain me, Papa, that I didn't learn any instrument. At least God gave me preaching. But one of the things that I wish I could play was drum or keyboard. Ah, like Shepherd Mike. Oh, my packing up. I'm telling you, that I'll play drum. The last time I sat down, I was thinking, ah, oh, let me go and learn how to play bass guitar. And I said, ah, can you play? You are old. I said, oh, I'll try. 
Hey, the day I learned how to play some instrument, oh, Munti, I say, oh, my so busy, I'm sorry, ha. Hey, I wish I could play drum. The way I would play the drum. I would play the drum for God to get down from heaven and say, and give me high five. Ah. So at least if I cannot play the drum, at least I can clap my hands. So if you cannot play instrument, there is one instrument all of us can play. It's the instrument of what? Clapping your hands. Hallelujah. So we will clap our hands. We will shout. We will praise the Lord. And it increases our anointing. One day, prophet Elisha, some people came to prophet Elisha and they wanted him to give them a prophecy. And at that time, the anointing gauge was down. And the prophet said, go and call me the musicians. Bring them, let them bring the trumpet. Let them bring the harp. And they brought the harp. And then they started worshipping. When you nyamashe, osoroni asa. And as they were worshipping, all of a sudden, the spirit of God dropped, bam! And the prophet started prophesying. And tell them what God is about to do. What God wants them to do. When you worship, you increase your anointing. So, praise and worship is not warm up. It's not for warm up. You find your warm up. Some of us think praise and worship is warm up. So that one is not important. Praise and worship is not warm up. It's the thing that brings the presence of God down. Without it, there will be no word. Hallelujah. If the word is the sacrifice, praise and worship is the altar. Yeah. Praise and worship is the altar. Hallelujah. So it's extremely important. That you, 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 you increase your praise and worship. Lack of praise and worship. Pride. Love of money also kills anointing. Love of money kills what? Anointing. Love of money. Who pays car? Who pays money? Anointing. Hey. One of the things God will do for you before he will anoint you is sometimes take away your love for money. Because if God gives you money, you love money and you get anointing, you will sell the anointing. <laughs> Did you hear what I said? I said, if God anoints you and you love money, you will sell what? Uh, have you seen anointing for sale before? In blue bottles, green bottles, yellow bottles, pink bottles. Have you not seen it before? Yes. If God anoints you and you love money, you will sell it. You, you will sell it. So first of all, most of the time, you will see that before God will anoint you, God will take something from you. God will take you something. David said, I will not offer to God any sacrifice that doesn't cost me. God will take something from you. That is why in trailblazers, for us, all of the shepherds who work for church, spiritual things like playing drum. Uh, the keyboardies, the drama, technical team. Nobody is paid for doing anything in the church. We don't, we don't receive salary for that. No, 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 no. No, because immediately you begin to play the drum for money. You are dangerous. You are a hireling. You are like an assassin. Hallelujah. Yeah, you are not a son. When I send you drummer to go and buy water for me, will I pay him? So if you are a son, how can I pay? God must pay a son to play a drum for his worship on Sunday. No. It's the same thing with me myself. There will come a time where we need those things for full time. Where we have a music school. That one... You are the music, you come in the morning, you do music till evening, you don't do any work. That one, full job, your salary will be guaranteed. But to play to, for God glory on the Sabbath, Charlie Lila. Hallelujah. And do you know that because of that, some of the Christians who never grow are instrumentalists. They don't grow. Look, when they are in the church, they are in the church when they, they will play instruments. When it's time for preaching, then they will go out. Two of us. They will go out. So the womanizers in the churches are instrumentalists. Most churches, they are womanizers and instrumentalists. They are the people who stand on the stage. 
The religious prostitutes, they are the ones. Because most of the time when the word is being preached, they are not there. They are not there. Or bought guitar and he will pay. Or say, feel free to know. Or go Jim from her. Me boy. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Na more hopa. Oh, it's good. Hallelujah. That is why trailblazers. I thank God for our instrumentalists. From day one, I said nobody is receiving salary, including myself. Hallelujah. And we have seen God himself take care of us. So, and we have seen the anointing increase as we serve. We have seen the anointing increase. My prayer for you is that your anointing will increase. As I have preached to you today, as you go home, make sure that all these things I have said, you will go far from them. You will not let them come near your dwelling place. You will see your anointing will be increasing. Because do you know something? You need the anointing to succeed. Though. Because the people of the world, they know where they go. Hey, man, don't believe them. I said, don't believe them. There is no rich man who controls serious money who doesn't have either God or the devil. He has one. Every rich man on earth who controls millions of dollars is a servant to one person, either God or the devil. No, 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 no. Look, the money you work for only put food on your table. But the money that makes you rich either comes from God or the devil. Did you hear what I just said? I said the money you work for only puts food on your table. But the money that makes you wealthy comes from God or the devil. And it is the anointing. It is the anointing that makes the difference. When you are anointed, favor will come into your life. When you are anointed, things that cannot work will work in your life. When you are anointed, places that people fail, when you go, you will succeed. And this morning, I pray that the anointing of God will come upon your life. And you will become a change in your family. God bless you. Amen. Amen. Ne, ne, next week, I will look at, we will look at the 14 killers, uh, 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 14 anointing boosters. Hallelujah. Today we look at the anointing killers. Next week we will look at anointing boosters. Amen. The things that you can do to increase your anointing. Amen. Let's pray.